Global Broadcasting Networks presents Coach Talk Radio. Create the time, money, and lifestyle you want with tips, tricks, and techniques that get you started today from some of the best Internet minds in the business. Now here are your hosts, Internet Brand Strategist Sandra Beck and Marketing Director for Toganet Radio, Scott Frazier. Hey guys and gals, this is Sandra Beck and this is Coach Talk Radio and we are going to be visiting with Josh Davis today. Uh, he is, our, oh thank God he came in the queue guys because I was getting a little nervous here going I'm going to have to do a whole show on his book. But you know what, if I had to do it, um, I could because I actually read his book. I actually have worked through his science-based strategies to get the best and most important work done and I feel like uh lisa who's my radio producer today i'm like lisa this is like the world's greatest self-help program for me just to be on the air and get to meet all these cool people um she can't answer me of course because she's busy producing this but um we've got a great guest today we've got josh davis and he wrote a book called two awesome hours that i came across uh through a publishing house uh a couple harper collins a couple maybe a year ago and i read it and then i read it again and then i highlighted it and um it's a really good book if you want to kind of reorganize your life so that you're much more effective and the end result is what we're going to talk about today because this book has helped me minimize the hours I'm working and maximize my output and that is pretty darn cool. Josh, welcome to the show. Hi Sandra, so so good to uh, reconnect with you. Yeah, it's like the before and after. Before I was like, ooh, this is what I learned from your book, and now we get the results. And that's got to just make your scientific little mind just go bananas. Oh, I love it. I, I, I've i been so eager to get a chance to check back in. <laughs> I am empirical, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> So before we get uh, started on the results, let's um, let's introduce you to our listeners and talk a little bit about Two Awesome Hours. Sounds great. So, so who are uh, you? Why should we listen to you? <laughs> Why do we care? <laughs> right, right. Uh, so uh, um, I'm Josh Davis. I'm the uh, uh, director of research and lead professor at the Neuro Leadership Institute. Um, I've also... I've uh, been on the faculty uh, for a number of years at Barnard College of Columbia University in the psychology department, um, and uh, uh, also someone who uh, just loves to teach. Um, you know, taught high school, um, inner city Brooklyn uh, public high school through um, at teaching at Columbia and Barnard, uh, and uh, and so I've put together this book recently. Also, I, I a couple. I would say, wow, now maybe it's almost uh, three years, two and a half years ago now that I started to tackle this challenge that, uh, you know, every single person I knew had more work to do than they could do. And it has, you know, you know, I would watch really um, accomplished, capable people who care about their work, who care about other people, you know, working hard, doing great stuff. Uh, moving their careers forward, moving the company forward they work for, and feeling bad about themselves at the end of the day. It just, you know, feeling like it was never enough. And, uh, you know, I, th I think there's some reasons we could probably all point to, like the fact that we're so connected now electronically, we can, we can work anywhere. Where, and so when we, you know, ask each other to do it uh, and send requests all the time, when we respond, we just keep getting rewarded for doing so and asking for faster work. So we had this sort of this overwhelm that was occurring. Uh, it wasn't how I wanted to live my life, and and it wasn't how I wanted my wife to live, and my friends and family, and uh, uh, and and I was starting to realize that you know I probably was in a position to be able to do something about it. So that's sort of who I am and what launched this particular mission. Well, that's, you know, really great because you're so much smarter than I could ever hope to be. <laughs> <laughs> and I love to have smart people on the show because they can tell me and, you know, the other moms listening today, not that we're not smart, but, you know, we probably can, you know, bake and cook and do a lot of things that you can't. But one of the things that you excel at is is figuring out 
how we can get our most important work done. You know, so many of our listeners are single moms and they're moms who work full-time jobs. And I'm not saying that being a homemaker is not a full-time job because it is and it can be. Um, But there are just specific demands when, especially when you're working out of the household, Joel, because I'm really lucky. I have my sound studio in my home. I've got my company based in my home. um, And I have the bedrooms over on the other side of my home. So my commute is literally, you know, down the hallway, turn the corner and open the door. So when you don't commute, you get like two more hours of your day. You don't have to get dressed up. So you've got grooming time that feeds into your day. So, you know, there's just specific conditions that, you know, every mother faces and being effective um, is is really hard for some of us. For some of us, we have special needs kids. We might have elder care issues and child care issues in the same household. We might just have a kid who's a pain in the ass. I have one of those that pops out every now and then. <laughs> and he just drives me bananas. I love him, but he can derail my whole day. Uh-huh. You're not going to talk badly yeah, about children. You know, I think, I, 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 I think there you. <laughs> no, but but I, I think what what you're pointing out is that there are additional challenges for um for for moms that there's uh, because it's not just that there's too much to do and that there's this overwhelm and everybody wants your attention, but when it's kids, then you know there's an importance level that's on that, and there's this sort of you know. While many people don't feel like it's okay to just blow off their boss, um, they really don't feel like it's even an option, you know, to just blow off their kids. It's not, you know, so there's, I think, I think it takes it to another level as well in, in terms of the challenges that are there. And so, you know, it, it's, I think we're at a point in history now where people can start to learn more about how their brains work and start to alleviate some of the pressure. I mean, those are some of my favorite comments to get um, that I think, uh, you know, you've shared with me and others have, have shared with me that, uh, that, that people say that they, they have more self-compassion after reading the book, that it's, you know, easier to, when they do decide to actually, you know, shift something around or take something off their schedule, they're able to actually do it and, and feel good about themselves. You know, and so that's also, I think, an important shift that can occur. And, you know, the more things you have and the more people who really matter to you, um, you know, the more I want to I want to get these lessons into your hands as fast as possible, basically. You know, that's what I'm hearing. Well, and like the second chapter is the one that I want to focus on right now, because um it's about managing your mental energy. And, you know, I'm going to tell you that I really thought before I read this book that I had inexhaustible energy. Like I was an inexhaustible resource. You know, I'm a mom. I'm a working mom. <laughs> you know, I have mm-hmm. just energy out the wazoo. And the thing that struck me was that I had to manage my mental energy. And you know, I bring up the kid that's, you know, a pain because he's an arguer. He'll argue, you know, eggs out of a chicken. And, you know, <laughs> it could be he just loves to debate. He loves to argue. It's not that he's necessarily mean or whatever. But I am so damn tired at 10 o'clock at night after a long work day, and he wants to argue, argue, argue. Or I have an early morning that I know is really rough. And I've started from your book saying, honey, I want to talk to you about this, but I can't do it right now because I learned from your book that every task we do, every decision we make, every argument we get into, every debate, everything like that is a toll on our mental energy and it fatigues our mind. I really never thought my brain got tired. I know that sounds stupid because why wouldn't it? But, you know, you're like stating the obvious man for me. That I see it <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Well, that's, I mean, that's the thing though. It's like, it, it makes perfect sense in retrospect. You can say, yeah, oh, well, it makes sense. Of course, brains would fatigue. Everything else about the body fatigues. At the same time, though, um, you know, before you've got evidence to that effect, then then it's just a, it's a hypothesis. It's like, well, maybe it fatigues, but maybe not, because sometimes I've been able to push through and I perform well enough, you know, and uh, and with sufficient motivation, you can. You know, if you've just gone if you've just gone jogging, uh, then, you know, it's it's not that you couldn't go for another jog right away, 
but with sufficient motivation, you could. You know, if somebody was chasing you with a knife, yeah, you can keep running. There's no problem there. But, it, you know, barring that, you have fatigued yourself in a lot of ways. And, and some of the surprising part, I think, comes in in recognizing just which things actually fatigue us. So, you know, when we're making when, – when, when you're having a conversation, let's say, with a, with a child who's uh, – or with a teenager especially, right, you're having this kind of an argument – there's a lot of information tracking. There's a lot of thinking. There's a lot of holding ideas in mind because you know that you're walking into a minefield, right? So you have to be very alert and be tracking a lot of information and as well as being aware of, you know, that there can be emotional consequences and, be, you know, getting upset and, and that sort of thing. So there is actually a lot to track. So while it may not seem like this is something that needs your best thinking, it still is actually quite taxing. It's requiring decision-making. It's requiring self-control. And so it's going to wear away on those tools so that if you do that and then walk into, let's say, uh, you know, one of your radio shows or if you then walk into running a meeting you know, or working on a business deal, that you are actually less capable of doing an effective job. Um, right afterwards than if you had put it off or if you had had the conversation after the work. You know, and sometimes you choose to prioritize the conversation. You say, you know what, the work isn't that important to me today, that particular work, and this conversation is. But either way, being aware of the effects uh, of that, that, that if it involves a lot of decisions, even if they're unimportant ones, if it involves a lot of self-control, and if it involves a lot of information tracking, it's actually going to make it harder for you to do those things successfully in the, the, you know, right afterwards. You know, Joe, I'm going to take us to commercial break. I'm here, or Josh, sorry. I'm here with Josh Davis, uh, PhD. He wrote the book called Two Awesome Hours. He is the reason that I don't wake up early in the morning and play Candy Crush and all these little addictive games before my kids wake up because I am aware now that my mental capacity has a limit. So when we come back from the break, we are going to talk about some of his other strategies. And the other one that I employ on a daily basis is a thing called uh, decision points. And he's going to explain what those are. And this is going to help you guys a lot. You're going to want to buy his book. It's wherever booksellers have his book, Two Awesome Hours, The Science-Based Strategies to Harness Your Best Time and Get Your Most Important Work Done. In today's business world, a helping hand or idea that doesn't come with an invoice is a treasured find. And if that happens to you, then you need to pay it forward to keep other entrepreneurs from making mistakes or getting a raw deal. It's called Paying It Forward with Josephine Girasi. Wednesday mornings at 10, 9 a.m. Central, Josephine is going to have the guests describe their accomplishments, the lessons they've learned, both good and bad, and then sharing those pieces of knowledge as we create a movement of Paying It Forward. For more information about Josephine, her business, and background, you can go to MyMomKnowsBest.com. Josephine Jirasi has always been a problem solver. She saw this need and has turned it into a movement. It's paying it forward with tips, tools, and advice, and hard lessons learned. These pieces of knowledge can make a huge difference for you, your business, and others. So join us for Paying It Forward with Josephine Jirasi, Wednesday mornings at 10 a.m., 9 a.m. Central, on Doginet.com. Reaching out from the heartland of the United States with quality programming, this is Tokinet Radio. I am not the woman I used to be. I'm free with Minister Diane Jones. Monday nights at 10, 9 central on Toginet. This is your chance, ladies, to hear stories of hope and healing from someone who's been there. Someone who has fought back from the horrors of incest. Minister Diane's innocence was stolen from her in the land of alcoholism and mental illness, which led to her being emotionally, physically, and sexually abused by her parents. Yet in spite of this trauma, she has gone on to become a successful wife, mother, registered nurse, and minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not the woman I used to be. I'm Free is a straight-up show to enlighten you and to lighten your load. Do not let the weight of this world or the things that have happened to you control your life. For more on the show and Diane and her book, The Story of Me, email her directly from her show page here on Toginet. 
Then, join us for I'm Not the Woman I Used to Be. I'm Free with Minister Diane Jones. Monday nights at 10, 9 central on toginet.com. Hey guys and dolls, this is Sandra Beck and this is Coach Talk Radio. I got to remind myself, I get confused, Lisa, our producer pointed out I've got to be on the right show at the right time. And you know what, Joel, um, Josh, I didn't, um, my last guest was Joel, so I apologize for calling you Joel twice. But um, Josh, you have changed the way we do homework in our house. And, you know, these are real life practical applications of Joel's books. And, you know, one of the things that he talked about was this, you know, decision making fatigues the brain. So what I've done is I've taught both my kids. I'm a single mom. So I'm pretty roasted. I'm fire roasted by eight o'clock at night. And I am not a math whiz on a good day. So what I've noticed is that I've taught my kids to start with their most difficult homework first, go on to the easier stuff, and then the reading that doesn't require anything to produce out of it, like they don't have to write a paper on it or whatever. They're just obligatory daily reading, 30 minutes and 60 minutes respectively for my kids. They finish at the end. And you asked me at the break when I told you this, like, you know, have you asked the kids if it's better Well, I don't know if it's better for them, but it's better for me because, A, they asked me questions on their homework when I'm fresher. That's 5 o'clock or or 3 o'clock in the afternoon versus 8 o'clock at night. But the frequency of them needing help goes down. Like after you asked me that, I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, I don't have to help them as much. And I'd love you to comment on that. That's such a great application. I'm so glad you're sharing that. Um, That's – uh, essentially, most people can expect that by the end of the day, they will have worn themselves out in a number of ways, that you're just less capable of doing quality work. Um, not that you can't keep working, but the work you're doing is going to have more errors. It's going to be harder to think clearly. Some things that would have actually been easy for you uh, at certain other parts of the day can seem you know, difficult and challenging and, and uh, you just can't figure them out when you're, when, you know, when you've gotten to that point. And I think most of us have had those experiences of trying to work too late into the night. Sometimes we don't even realize because it's been a slow transition. Um, but uh, as you get practice, as you gain practice recognizing the, you know, the, the mental energy that you have, then, then you can start to really work with that and say, okay, you know what? It's uh, it's it's 7 p.m. I'm really not no good for anything that needs my attention. I'm going to switch to the easier stuff. And so by giving your kids practice with this, then they get a chance to start recognizing the the value of that early on. And it can become habit. It can become just part of their daily lives so that they don't have to, you know, do as much retraining to get there. So I think it's a fantastic thing to do. It makes sense of the challenges. I do want to bring up one caveat i'm sure some people will be wondering you know well there's some of us who feel like we do our best work late at night you know and and we're really night people so it's true there are some differences in circadian rhythms some people really are more alert at different times of day than other people there are 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 some the majority of people earlier in the day some people later but what i'll encourage you if you are someone who gets gets to work late at night I would encourage you to think about what you're doing in the time leading up to that because oftentimes it's people who have uh, just kind of like slogged through the day and done the, you know, not used their time productively through the day, worn themselves out, then had a refresher at some point in the night, some time off, they they were doing something social, they were uh, having dinner, you know, and then finally they get back to it after they've had a little bit of a chance to recharge. So it may not be the late night aspect of it, but the fact that you're approaching work after a chance to recharge, um, assuming you've had enough sleep as well. And that's something that can profitably done, be done earlier in the day. Um, so, you know, the late night piece as well as the, the homework piece, I think uh, those are two, two aspects of it that you're really taking advantage of uh, with your kids. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for that. The other thing that I took away from your book, and you know, there are many good points. We're just highlighting a few, and you know, I think everyone should go out and buy it. Um, is this recognizing your decision points? And that was something that 
it just stumped me at first. I had to read the whole chapter and, and, um, and then I was like, Oh, now I know what he's talking about. And for, you know, working moms, for working parents, for overworked executives, you know, entrepreneurs that have a million things to do every day, you got to slow down and recognize that it's a decision point. I had to actually make a conscious effort to figure out what my decision points were because I'm rolling, 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 you know, and so much of me these days, you know, after doing this for 20 years is on autopilot. Mm hmm. It, this one's a game changer. I hear from so many people that, you know, they they read the book and uh, they'll have, I mean, people will tell me the, the next day I started putting this into practice and, uh, you know, I've been doing it ever since the 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 lesson, the sort of the core lesson about how the brain work that this is built on is the fact that we work on autopilot, as you were just saying. We rely on autopilot for as much as we can, and this has a lot of value. This lets us, you know, if, if I have learned how to walk, then I don't have to think about it. I can then have a conversation while I'm walking. If I've learned how to run a class, it's a much more complex thing to do, but if I've learned how to run a class, well, I don't have to think about a lot of the mechanics of it and when to, you know, I, I sort of automatically notice when the energy is shifting, but I can pay close attention that way to to you know students faces and seeing whether they're really getting the messages and that sort of thing you know it, as uh, uh we have these modes of operating where we're taking advantage of something that uh psychologists call being cognitive misers so you know all else equal we will use the less cognitively expensive way of doing something and the least cognitively expensive way of doing something is to is to just let your habits run the show so you know we have commuting mode you know, you have uh, running a meeting mode, you have tele telephone mode, um, you have uh, presentation mode, you know, that we all have these modes that we get in. And actually, the more experienced we get in life, then the more automatically we can run things. So we're actually more often going to be on autopilot. So that mode with, thing that you're talking about, yeah. I just want to clarify for this. Is this why, like, this is one of the biggest struggles I have in my day because um, now it's become Coach Talk Radio, Sandra's personal therapy hour. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I'm doing heavy concentration programming because, you know, I do own a technology company. So the majority of the day I'm I'm deep in programming. It's very quiet. It's very silent. I actually like to dim the lights in my office so I can really focus on what I'm doing. And I kind of like just disappear when I get disturbed like the kids walk in or a client calls or whatever and I have to pull myself out of that I can't like it's really hard for me and if I'm in radio mode the lights are bright I've got coffee and tea and snacks you know for a couple hours I'm on the air and you know everything's so different and I do need to build in a transition for myself it can take as much as 15 or 30 minutes for me to transition out of one I don't know what it is what you're the brain expert you know one thing to another mm -hmm. especially something really intense like running a radio show um but the other things, too, if you've been at it for a long time, it's probably going to need a little bit more time to transition out. Programming, there's a programming mode. You know, it's, when we're on autopilot, it is very hard. One of the characteristics of autopilot is that you can't just snap out of it. Um, and, and so our, our habits, our well-learned habits, will carry us through. And it's not that we're unconscious, but we're not consciously monitoring all the other things on our to-do list once we get into one of these modes. When the auto, when you know, when the autopilot can no longer work, that's when a decision point is born. Because what happens is there's a conflict that your behavior is no longer can be, uh, you know, it's not clear what behavior comes next. So if you're programming, and then somebody does come in to interrupt you, then autopilot can't handle that because one set of uh, programs is driving you to pay attention and keep programming and the other set of programs is driving you to turn and socially respond to the person who's just come in they're incompatible and when we have these incompatible drives that causes uh, more prefrontal activity in the brain to come online that allows us to be able to consciously deliberate to to make a choice about and but this is this is more cognitively taxing to make a choice about what task to work on. So we don't get that many of these these moments in the day. We only have a handful of these decision points. They come when autopilot breaks down, 
And so we need to seize them because that's when you have the chance to choose what to do. There's the famous old advice, do what's important, not urgent. This is how you do that is to capture these. Well, and for me, and this is where I've modified your book a little bit because, you know, I am me and I'm a radio show host. So I know much more than you who are a well-vetted PhD. Um, <laughs> I actually build in now decision points during my day, conscious ones. Like there is a decision point before I start in the morning. There's another decision point that happens at 11 o'clock because I get up and I, I go out in the kitchen. I make my dad his his lunch and, and, and feed him and take care of him. And then when I come back, there's another decision point. Like, okay, what, you know, like where am I going to go? What am I going to do with these things? Then I make another decision point at about 3 o'clock. Then I have another one right before I get leave my office and get the kids so everybody ready for dinner. And then there's another decision point. And I purposely I, – I synced them with my Fitbit, as goofy as that sounds. I have my Fitbit, and it rattles six times a day to, to, to alert me to stop and think about what you're doing and what needs to be done. Uh, what you're doing is uh, – you'll, you'll be happy to know that we are 100 percent in agreement with the, the right strategy. So once you know about these decision points, then – it's how do we actually take advantage of them. And one way is to learn to recognize them when they come up organically, uh, which you know is, is challenging because it often feels unpleasant. You just feel like you're not productive all of a sudden. But the other is to build them in ahead of time, to know that certain things are going to happen in your day and you can respond to that. Like I know that there's going to be a moment when I've just arrived at the office. I know that there's going to be a moment when I've just gotten out of a meeting. You know, I and and other things like that, or to have certain calendar points in the day that you know are likely to be, you know, on a regular day. They're likely to happen certain times when it's going to be useful. And I love the approach you've taken of, uh, you know, letting your using technology to actually remind you. Um, yeah, and now I'm that you know the this- importance of these. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I need to take us to commercial break. But these real life practical applications you can make, guys, in your day, they can make a difference. They can shave time off your workday. I have gotten my workday from eight hours down to four hours most days. That's a huge deal. I haven't achieved my two awesome hours yet. But when we come back from the break, we're going to talk to Josh Davis a little bit more about awesome hours. Cuisines and Sacred Rituals is a quest, a place, and a feast. Join host Vilasi Venkatachalam every week to explore myths, mystique, old medicine, and brilliant modern solutions through a dazzling kaleidoscope of cuisines, cultures, and cures. This is the place where tribes gather, strangers and familiars, to be memory keepers and makers of our evolving, enduring, evergreen, spoken legacy of wisdom and ingenuity. In Velasi's words, when we do old things in new ways and new things in old ways, we paint with an inspired palette, weave our own healing traditions, and become our own guru. Velasi is a troubadour of secret cuisines and sacred rituals. She collects stories of wisdom, ingenuity, and grit. She believes wellness and transformation happen when you stand at the threshold of delight and discovery. She displays her hidden penchant for drama when she leads the safari at the supper club. Her favorite pastime is to extol the marvels of cuisines, cultures, and cures. To her audience in workplaces, seminars, and salons, her mantra is, be your own guru. She is a biochemist, botanist, and alchemist who likes to churn delightful, useful things from a brew of art and science, ancient and evolving, old medicine and new cures. Join Velocity every Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, only here on the WooHoo Radio Network. It's words you never heard. When searching for new words you never heard, I sometimes come across words from other countries that don't have English equivalents. For instance, culatino is an Italian word for the mark left on a table by a cold glass. 
Wort Einsamkeit is a German word for a feeling of solitude and connection to nature. Did you notice that Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous book is a part of the word? Kumorebi is a Japanese word to describe the way sunlight looks as it filters through the trees. Sobre mesa is a Spanish word that refers to the period of time after a meal when you have conversations with the people you ate with. If someone tells you a joke so badly that you end up laughing at them instead of the punchline, they would be called a gaius in Indonesia. It's words you never heard. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my new app, Too Funny for Words. Taking care of Hey guys and dolls, this is Sandra Beck and this is Coach Talk Radio and we are visiting today with Josh Davis and Two Awesome Hours is his book, Science-Based Strategies to Harness Your Best Time and Get Your Most Important Work Done. Now this isn't your typical time management book, it really isn't. You know, I, I went for a whole week, Josh, to the Franklin Covey Institute in the 90s and you know, and, and the Franklin Planner people, I still use my Franklin Planner today, I just ordered my new Franklin's uh, for next Next year because I have a, a beautiful system from them and I, I love their products. But this is not like that. This is more like your mental planning. It's your you know, you make these little changes and they have phenomenal results. And, you know, I talked a little bit about in the opening segment that um my work day was so much longer and I was getting less done because of certain things. And, you know, one of the things that I did was, you know, recognize my decision points, which you write so eloquently about. And then there was another thing about managing my mental energy, lots of good tips and, and understanding in there. But the other one that was two of them actually that were powerful for me, but this one we're just going to talk about, which is they kind of go hand in hand, like stop fighting distractions and making your workspace work for you. Two of those things to me went hand in hand in the like retrofit of my work day. Mm, yeah. So, so, you know, stop fighting distractions. Uh, the, the concept here now, I, uh, people hearing that phrase, they might think, oh, what does that mean? We're just supposed to give in to distraction and, um, you know, when we get distracted, go with it. The, what I'm trying to highlight here is that it's the fighting part that actually gets in the way. It's the, it backfires. And it's not that you should just give in to it. But uh, so I think I can sort of spell out the options that are the menu of options that, are, that occur. So when, we're, when you're sitting down, uh, you know, you're trying to work, 15, 20 minutes goes by. Very common. Um, if your brain works, if, if you have a functional brain, you probably will start to drift at that point. If you don't, you know, then uh, you know maybe there's a problem. But so there's so you should expect that you're likely to drift. And what we do at that point, so one of the options, and I know I tried this plenty for years and years, which is to just beat myself up to say, you know, try to use willpower. To, you know, what's wrong with you? Stay on task. You've got to keep working. That didn't work. Um, and, uh, but I try, I kept trying it anyway, um, cause I didn't know what else to do. Then there's the option of saying, okay, you know what? I'm going to take a break. I can't seem to focus. I'm going to go and do something fun. Maybe see who likes my posts on Facebook or something worthwhile, like, like billing or, or checking my, uh, email. Right. But when you do those things, it's easy to get lost on autopilot and just go for, uh, you know, a uh, half hour, maybe even an hour before you realize what's happening, before you get another decision point. So, you know, those tend to, to suck energy. What what also happens, though, is that they block the background processing that occurs when we mind wander. Now, you know, mind wandering gets a, a bad name culturally. You know, it's drilled into us. You shouldn't mind wander. Nobody ever gets a report card saying, you know, that they should mind wander more. You know, this is uh, – it's – it's something that is uh, definitely looked down upon. People don't like to talk about how much they just sort of drift and their minds are wandering. They daydream. However, when we let our minds wander for a few minutes, the, it allows us to um, integrate our kind of executive goal focus kind of brain processing with our social processing. Usually it's one or the other that's active. When minds wander, then they integrate. They're both active. 
Um, so you can kind of find ways that the different parts of your life can work together. When minds wander, we're, we become more creative at whatever it was we were working on. So if you, um, you know, let's say you're trying to figure out what's the best way to put together uh, a team for a project you're working on or what's the best way to solve some complex coding challenge if you're a programmer, then uh, if, you, if you let your mind wander, meaning you're not paying attention to what you were thinking about, but you're not doing something else so taxing that it's blocking mind wandering. You know, if you just kind of drift and stare out the window and then come back to it, even if it's just a few minutes, you're actually more likely to come up with creative solutions, and the solutions are more likely to be rated as more creative uh, as well. If you, if you have that time mind wandering and then coming back to it, more so than if you had just worked on it for the same amount of time straight through. So you're actually more likely to have these kind of creative solutions. There is work that's happening in the background that's non-conscious, and we actually keep it from happening when we keep on focusing on, and, and taking in more information. It also helps with other things like helping you reframe what you're working on to delay gratification more effectively. There's, just, there's a whole host of benefits to mind-wandering. I don't know very many things that can do all that. And you get it in, you know, a few minutes when you let your mind wander, but you only get it if you let your mind wander. So, you know, so when your mind starts to wander, let it stare out the window, uh, you know, put on some music. You got to remember to turn the music off afterwards so it doesn't keep so it doesn't distract you later. But, you know, put on some music and just notice the sounds, uh, you know, um, stand around, walk outside and just hang out for a little bit and get some fresh air. Those kinds of things allow you to, to do that. And what's really nice is it gets boring after a few minutes. And then you're, so you sort of drift back to, oh, wow, well, what was I doing? What, you know, and, and then you have a chance to actually get back to work. If you, you know, that's so different than if you go and try to do something else that's, quote, fun or worthwhile. So you know, that's the first piece, I think, about really understanding, understanding attention and distraction. Um, so I'll pause there and give you a chance to, to say anything else, and then there's, there's more I can say about how that rolls into the workspaces that we choose. Yeah, well, and that's where, like, you know, the A plus B equals C. Um, you know, I am a huge scatterbrain. You know, that's when I was a little girl, my mom would call me a scatterbrain, and, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, and I, I didn't take it as an insult. I, I took it as a compliment because I'm me. But one of the things I do know about myself is I'm like Scooby Doo. I'm like, ooh, what's over there? Ooh, shiny tire rolling by. And, you know, I'm really <laughs> easily distracted. And so when I read your chapter on distractions, and then I read your make your workspace work for you. I decided I was going to do my own little Dr. Josh Davis, ex you know, test. And what I did was I took out of my office because I work in a in a the actually the maids room of my house has been retrofitted into my office and sound studio. And I have these real high bookshelves and everything's like Pottery Barn black. It's really cool. Um, but I went through and I thought, OK. Because I'm easily distracted and my mind wanders, what if I help guide my mind wandering? Because sometimes I, I get up and I look and I, you know, I get distracted by whatever I see and then I kind of go off on that tangent. And I thought, what if I put stuff in there that I really want to think about or really want to consider or really want to be part of my mind wandering? And it's interesting because it's, it's brought a whole new level of elevation up in my productivity. And, and can I ask you what some of those things are that you've strategically Absolutely. placed for yourself? Yeah, I I um I I love these 31 products. They're embroidered um things. So I bought these boxes. They're like um you know, they're like cloth boxes with embroidery out. And I wrote on one of them in embroidery bouncing with style because I always want to be uplifting and empowering to people and then Spirit Team, which is a book that I'm working on. Then over on the wall I got some of these uh soft-sided hanging things and again they're embroidered and they say space to dream, follow up, to do. And then one says money money. And so when I my eye is going around the room, I hit that space to dream and sometimes I think about my ideas, my creative ideas. 
or I might look at the follow up thing and follow up because I'm real um I'm really attached to words. Like if there's a picture I can I don't even see it. But if it's a word on something, it has big meaning to me. And then I'll look at money, money, and then it'll just percolate around and go, Oh, I have to do the billing. Who did I forget to bill this month? And boom, you know, when I go to do the billing, it's there. It's really kind of fun to play with your own brain. <laughs> yeah, that's such a nice way of talking about it, that it's, it's, we can play games with ourselves once we know. And I have some little things that are scattered around my office that are, that are funny, you know, because I just, you know, little things that I've done that I'm sort of proud of some prank. And maybe there's a, either a picture or a, um, there's a, a business card that I've created that um, kind of reminds me of a uh, fun time. It's because it's it was like a prank business card and um, some, some nice bits of art. There's a window, there's plants, things that I enjoy spending some time looking at and, and where those things are likely to take my mind is somewhere that is either interesting or enjoyable. And so you can do these things. You can totally set yourself up. And the flip side is that just as those things can help guide your mind where you want it to. And by the way, I like how, you know, most of the stuff, it wasn't about guiding you towards reminding you about specific tasks that you had to work on. It was about leading you to think about things that are valuable to you to think about um, in your life. And so, so the flip side is that we also can't avoid it. So anything that's out that's going to catch our attention is going to lead us to think certain ways. And, uh, and so when we leave clutter out on our desks, we're doing ourselves a massive disservice because you know, our attention systems, they're not designed to stay focused. They're designed to pick up on what's changing. They're designed to pick up on what's novel, what's salient, what's threatening, what's rewarding. So, you know, after 15, 20 minutes, when they drift, they're going to pick up on all those things that are around. And if there's lots of those things around for them to pick up on, they'll probably get distracted even more frequently, you know, probably right away when you try to sit down. So, you know, there was, there was a study that looked at what, what people leave out on their desks, actually, when they leave things on their desks. And it turns out that the vast majority of the stuff that people leave out on their desks is meant to be reminders. So if we think about what those are meant to be reminders of, it's things that you didn't get to because there wasn't time or emotionally you didn't want to do it because you were concerned about somebody's reaction or you didn't know how to do it or all those kinds of things, right? It's exactly the wrong stuff to be reminded of when you've just decided that the time that you're about to work is for something that really matters and you want to devote yourself to it. You know, if you've just decided this, this next hour, these next two hours is for something I really want to be working on and it's important, then that stuff is exactly the wrong stuff to be confronted with. So it's worth just stacking it up and putting it literally out of sight. Come back to it some later time when you're not at your best to just kind of flip through it and see if anything still needs your attention, you know, decide whether it's going to get its own dedicated time. But Joel, I'm going to take us to yourself. commercial break yeah. on that thought. When we come back, we're going to have more great advice from author Josh Davis of Two Awesome Hours. This is Uncommon Sense for Leaders, a forum for exploring leadership from the intellect, the heart, and the spirit. Whether you're a leader now or aspire to be a leader in the future, you owe it to yourself to learn about the big ideas that have shaped the careers of compelling communicators, masters of influence, and highly effective leaders. Uncommon Sense for Leaders. Tune in to hear thought-provoking ideas on every aspect of leadership. You can expect dynamic discussions with special guests, quick tips you can apply immediately for better results, and the tools you need to take you from where you are to where you want to be as a leader. Are you ready to crack the code for achieving unprecedented results? Then join the host for Uncommon Sense for Leaders, Catherine Carlisi, every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, right here on the All Business Radio Network. It's words you never heard. Harvey McKay, author of the best-selling book, Use Your Head to Get Your Foot in the Door, includes job search secrets no one else will tell you. 
Harvey is a true ideal praxist. That's a person who puts ideas into practice. Harvey admits landing the right job can be more difficult than the job itself. And successful people can't have pornophobia. That's the fear of work. But in these economic times, it can be a necessity to make money any way you can. What's a word for using any means to make money? Womo de Kunquais. So what's the best job to have? Will Rogers once said, the best job in the country is the vice president. All he has to do is get up every day and ask, how is the president? It's Marching Day. I'm Carolyn Davidson, and you can have fun challenging your words you never heard vocabulary with my new app, Too Funny for Words. Taking care of business every day. Taking care of business every way. Taking care of business. Hey, guys and dolls, this is Sandra Beck, and this is Coach Talk Radio. And we are talking with two awesome hours expert, Josh Davis. He has helped revamp my workday, and as a result, I'm eternally grateful. One of the things that he talks about in his book, and for many of you, your office space is kind of a personal reflection of you. It's it's a place for you to create and, and, and produce and... Um, we get so involved in our offices, uh, Josh, because, you know, we're here all day. We hear all these things. You got to have the right chair. You got to have the right desk height. The computer's got to be all this, blah, blah, blah. Clean your desk off. Put your stuff in piles, whatever, blah, blah, blah. All those things are really important. And one of the things when I connected the dots in your book, um, you know, I bought these bins that are embroidered from a 31 company in their fortune. And in order to justify them, I have to really work with you on your book to <laughs> justify the expense. <laughs> um, but realistically, what they are is their we containment. We should let the listeners know that I don't get any, uh, any kickback. There you go. The yeah, you don't get any those. kickback from that. Yeah. And, um but these are containers for the chaos, and they're containers that help me keep organized, but they keep my brain organized because psychologically or emotionally or mentally, when I work on a project, I take that box out and I open it up, and there is my notes, there is my resource materials, there is my whatever. They might even have a dedicated computer in there for the project. And then when I'm done with it, I put it up there and I put it away, and I can still see the embroidery, so it never leaves my mind, but it's not cluttering up my mind. All the parts are cluttering because if I looked in my bouncing with style box, I would see four or five unread self-help books, you know, my notes, the, you know, four things I need to do, a computer in there that holds my bouncing with style stuff that needs to be updated. You know, my mind will go on all those things. And that's, that's not what I want in my work day. But if I just look up at the box, I know it's there. I can kind of think about it and daydream, but not get so stressed out. So, you know, I just need you to shrink that out into why it's why I spent all this money on my office. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, part of it is that you have good taste in design, and so you recognize that. Uh, um, I haven't seen the boxes, but I'm you know I'm, good, I'm willing to go out on a limb and, and guess that. The uh, you know what you're doing is you're working with your brain. You're making your life, you're making your mental life easier by doing that because you know. When you can take all of those items and put them aside, what you're allowing yourself to do is to be present for what you've chosen to work on. So, you know, this is the pieces, the pieces all kind of start to work together this way. So you take a decision point and you actually have that moment where you remember, okay, wait, what is actually important um, today for me to be accomplishing? Right. I really need to be, you know, writing this piece that I'm going to send to some journal, right? For, you know, it's, 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 it, it is easy enough to know what's really important, but the hard part is remembering to do it. So you do that and you've decided, yeah, you know what? And I've got some mental energy right now. I can devote some time. I'm going to give myself some time right now to work on that important project. If you've got all the other stuff sitting around reminding you, then you, you know, that's going to make it so much harder for you to actually take advantage of that time. So having a system like that, if there are, compartments to your life where there really are distinct projects, distinct types of work, maybe distinct businesses, to be able to have a different place where you can go and put it away um, is a really useful thing. And, um, you know, I think over time with that practice, it starts to become easier to recognize certain things that are actually aren't even worth holding on to at all. 
you know, and just, you know, ending up keeping less stuff, actually, um, let, being more realistic with yourself about what you are actually going to get to because you've got that greater mental freedom and clarity to be able to be thinking more often and seeing what's actually leading to success as opposed to just feeling like, oh, my God, there's this pile and I have to get to it. So that's, that's I think, a, a very useful thing. And there's, uh, I applaud the, the creative, flexible ways that you're applying those ideas. You know, I think in the book I only talked about you know, the clutter on your desk and then taking that in, to the next step. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it, well, that's where, you know, um, my new love is my label maker. And I, I am labeling everything because I used to have, you know, as a computer tech, I used to have like sitting on my desk at any given time, you know, like five or six extra m- mice. I'm looking in my drawer here. I've got half a router. I've got two or three old iPods and um, a bunch of USB sticks. And instead, I went out to Staples and I bought this little standing tower with clear white plastic drawers. And I have one marked Bluetooth, one marked media, one marked stationary, one marked travel, and uh, one marked that just says components. And so I can stuff all that stuff in there. Now I know where it is. It's not organized in there, but it's out of sight of my actual view that I sit in every day. Mm-hmm. And and that's it. So for people who really like organizing things, you may have an even better way of organizing. I'm not saying don't do that. But what I am saying is that for those of us who don't already – get things out of the way you know these are the reasons why um in order to give yourself the best chance uh to really work effectively and be present for whatever work you're doing finding ways to get those things out of the way really makes a difference and uh you know it's amazing i'm someone who's been kind of you know a mess had a messy desk forever and in the last uh you know year i guess that was towards the end of the book that i was you know i was researching as i was going along um i you know, I pretty much have a clean desk, a clear workspace uh, where you can't see much other stuff uh, since then. And um, it is it is easier to do. So that, that was also a nice thing is that as I was learning, I was making use of the stuff myself. Um, so- well, and that's one thing that you did. You forced me to clean my desk. You know, like I said, I had all this stuff on here and it's stuff I use. But now that it's, it's in a drawer and I could, you know, bend over and reach the drawer, it's not like it's, you know, taxing me too much um but i find that now after you know like i guess it's been like you know probably 180 days that i've been working with your system here um i have to clean off my desk before i start my work day which is so like people who know me are like what who are you and what did you do with santa (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, so you know, some of the other things we do, I I like to talk about the typical way that we set up our workspaces is booby trapping our workspaces with distractors. That we actually set ourselves up for failure in so many ways, um, and we don't have to. And this is, you know, whether you, you may have your own workspace at home that you could totally customize. You may have a cubicle. You may have shared desks. You know, that where there's almost nothing you can do. Even in those contexts. There are a few things that we can all be aware of that we can maximize. So one is there is plenty of research on the effects of noise on concentration. uh, And uh, it's pretty straightforward stuff. It's not all that controversial. Um, It's it's that the the noise will make it harder. Uh, Noise is going to make you probably make more errors and take longer to do things. Now, having said that, we don't have to be at our best all the time. You know, we and we can't be, but what we can do is look for ways to set up brief periods of really being at our best, give ourselves a noise free environment, for example, in that time, and a clear workspace in that time to do the important work. And, you know, maybe there's something else that some stuff you have to get back to that you can do relatively on autopilot, you don't really care about, it doesn't matter if it's perfect. Yeah, sure. Turn the TV on in the background. You'll enjoy the time more, even though it is going to take longer and you are going to make more errors and you're not going to remember it as well. But, you know, so that we can think about our work that way. Is this stuff that needs my best time or is this stuff that doesn't? So for a lot of the work we're doing during the day that that matters, noise is going to get in the way. There is some evidence that for people with extreme difficulty paying attention that some white noise can make it easier. Apart from that, though, it's pretty much noise makes things worse. And speech is the absolute hardest thing for people to block out. 
So okay, so in, I just want to come yeah. in and say that because that's one of the things. When I moved my office in my home, I got a lot of flack from people because they're like, you're going to be lonely. You're going to be this. You're going to be that. When people are talking and I'm trying to work, Josh, I can't focus on either one and then in my head it's like half of what like the person in the other cubicles talking on the phone and and you know and so I used to run a fan like 24 7 because it would mute like that interference and so that's not just me I mean I really have a hard time of it which is why I need to work alone in a bat cave um Mm -hmm. with no other you know influence like that but that's everybody has that that's not just me it's not just you. I mean, there are some differences. Some people can have an easier time tuning it out. But no, that's not just you. And, you know, if you ask almost anyone, they'll tell you, yeah, you know, if I happen to be able to get some work done early in the morning before I go to work, or maybe I'm staying late once everyone has left the office, you know, that once there's no one around, or if I, if, if you know, I'm able to work from home one day for some reason, if there's no one around, then that's when I can get my work done. And, it, you know, it, we sort of talk about it and we joke about it, but actually there's something real there and it really fits with how brains work, that people are very interesting to us. And that makes sense because human brains are designed to pay attention to other people, to figure out who we can trust. And, you know, so happiness comes from social connection by and large. Like these, it's, it's very important to us. So, of course, if there are people there, and they're talking, that's going to grab our attention. That is extremely important information to our attention system. So that's what they're designed to pick up on. So, yeah, so, you know, a fan can help to block that out. But even better, if you, you know, noise-canceling headphones. And, or, you know, sometimes uh, I know people now who schedule a little bit of time in uh, a conference room if, you know, they know that they really have an important project. Or come in late that day if they can, you know, or that sort of thing. So that they can have some of that time without those distractors. Well, yeah, I used to tell my boss, like, you know, and they would laugh at me, but like, look, I will do a really great job for you. I will solve this problem if you leave me alone and I can shut the door and take a nap. And, you know, they'd laugh at me because they'd see my door shut. And I would, I would lay on my floor. I would take a nap. Like, you know, I knew what I needed to do, but if there was noise or distraction or things like that, like I am Done, 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 dead in the water. I need to close the show, Josh. As always, it's been a pleasure. I think this is our second or third show together. I really enjoy you. I really uh, like what you have to say. You made a difference in my life. Uh, We've got Josh Davis here. Two awesome hours, science-based strategies to harness your best time and get your most important work done. It's not a hard read, guys. It's about 150 pages. It's big print, so it's not really tiny, skinny print Mm -hmm. that makes it different difficult for you. It's in a way you can understand it. You can read it and start implementing these things today. Tiny changes make big, big differences in your life. Josh, thank you for being our guest today. Thank you so much. You are quite welcome uh, for uh, Coach Talk Radio. This is Sandra Beck. We'll catch you again next week. Thank you for listening. On behalf of Sandra Beck and Scott Frazier, we want you to get out there today to make more money with less time and effort so you can live the life you want. Tune in next week for more tips, tricks, and techniques from Coach Talk Radio.